So we're covering some basic mathematics that are, is needed because we're going to be using it to create object features that we'll then do things like statistics on. Um, and we've been talking about surface geometry. And I remind you that we defined this M Roman two matrix, which allows you to find <coughs> the cur all curvature information in regard to the swing of the normal on a surface <coughs> in any walking direction. But I remind you that when we this particular matrix refers to a particular F1 in the tangent plane, which is a walking direction, and an F2, which is orthogonal to it, and which you may alternatively walk in. And we saw that when you swing, interested in the normal swing, the component of the swing in F1 into F1, nose dive, is K1, and the swing of F2 into F2 is K2, and the twist in both cases is tau. What I wanted to point out that I failed to the last time is that this matrix <coughs> has eigenvectors and eigenvalues. It's a two by two matrix, and we all know that to diagonalize a matrix by rotation, you, uh, <coughs> you, uh, when, when you do that, the rotation there is to the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. But that's exactly what we're doing here. We're trying to turn M Roman two into pure nosedive, which is to say tau equals zero, which is to say this is a diagonal matrix. And the, the result is that if you, if you apply the, the standard diagonalization math algorithm, if you will, to uh, the Roman M2 in any direction, you get the principal directions. Yeah? Wait, so we're talking about the swing of the normal vector. Yes, that's F3. Right, so I, I don't understand. I, okay, what, were you, what do you apply to that matrix? Okay, so <clears throat> what, I remind you that the swing of the normal for a very small step is in the tangent plane. So the right. result of the swing is a vector in the tangent plane. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. So then it's telling you... And, and that vector is telling you uh, how fast and in what direction the normal swings. And that, the, that in turn has a component in the F1, the walking direction, and in the F2 direction. Or alternatively, in the F2 direction if you walk in it, and the F1 direction, which is orthogonal to it. Does that answer your question, Sam? Um, yeah, so the matrix tells you the components of, okay. The normal swing, the component of that into this vector and into this vector. Okay. When you walk this way. Right. And they also, when you walk this way, the two components in, of the swing, which are different. Well, the tau is the same. Okay, so, okay, so I, I had not noted that, that what you're doing when you get the principal directions is just, uh, just computable by eigen, eigen analysis on this matrix for any Pick any walking direction, figure out what this matrix is, and then you diagonalize it and you'll get the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues that are always <coughs> the principal directions and the principal curvatures. Okay, so let's go on to wh where we were last, <coughs> last time. I wanted to say a few words about the topology of objects. <coughs> so, <coughs> A very important uh, property of an object is how many holes there are in it. Uh, this may be true through holes, or it may be like in a 3D object, if you have a, 
uh, a sphere, but you've taken out the earth, but you've taken out the core of the earth, right? So there's a hole now where the core was. <laughs> um, anyway, the point is that if you have, for example, a sphere, you can deform it into this object here, but you can't deform it into something that has a hole in it, or a pretzel that has two holes in it. You can't deform a, a donut into a pretzel, right? And so this topological property of how many holes there are is an important one that we have to deal with, and that count is the genus, called the genus of the, uh, of the surface. So a sphere has genus zero. Any of these objects that I have in front of me have genus zero, right? But a donut has genus one and a pretzel genus two, right? Um, and from the genus, there's another number that is shown by the Greek letter uh, <laughs> uh, chi, I guess, and it's uh, Two, two minus twice the genus. Okay, so for spherical topology, it's two. Okay, <laughs> and uh, one of the things that we're going to be interested in, in is vectors on the surface. Okay, so you have, for for example, uh, flow vectors. Uh, it, when you're doing a diffeomorphism, that might move things on the surface not flow of the deformation of the object, but a flow of the parameterization of the object. So places here move to other places on the surface. Another example is just the principal directions. Take one of the principal directions, call it V1, and at every point on the surface you have a vector that is a principal direction. So you have a field of vectors on a surface. And there's an interesting property called the winding number for every place on the surface where that, that, that vector field is zero. That is to say, there may be some places on the surface where the vector is zero. And it turns out for a, a, for a surface that does not have Euler number zero, such as spherical, things with spherical topology, you must have places that have zero vectors in them. They're called singular points. They, can, they cannot fail to exist. O only for, so when the genus is one, the Euler number is zero, and then it's possible to have no singular points. But for, for pretzels, you can't have none. And for sorry, things with no holes, you can't have none. And moreover, for, the, for those places where, where the vector is zero uh, in the field, you have a property that's called the, the winding number that is com computed by the way in which the field approaches the zero place. All those vectors come together and approach that place of zero. Okay, so um, in this example, if you look at around this zero point here, you have the vector fields going outwards, uh, going inwards here and outwards there and around in these little circles here, <laughs> little loops. And if you take your, take a bar and start it somewhere and <coughs> rotate the bar and count how many turns there are of this vector field as you would make one 360 degree rotation, you get something called the winding number of that special in singular point. This one has winding number two, and it turns out that the sum of the winding numbers <coughs> at a uh, 
the sum of the winding numbers uh, at a uh, in a uh, uh, sorry over all those points has to be equal to the Euler number. Surprising topological result. And this is going to be of some importance to us as we <laughs> consider principal direction pro properties on the sphere. <laughs> because if you look at this place here, you see this, the, the vector field having this funny behavior. It turns out it happens when things are locally spherical, <clears throat> when kappa 1 equals kappa 2, <laughs> when the radius of curvature is the same in all directions, and that's true for any point on a sphere. So at a place where the spheres are locally spherical, we get, and we must get, these so-called umbilics, which are these local spherical points, and we'll be computationally worried about that on the one hand because it makes all hell break loose near there, but also realize that these places are really pretty special places that we want to use for correspondence, for example. Okay? Okay, the other <coughs> Uh, the other property that we want is the notion of connected components. Okay, so, uh, oh, by the way, I'd like to give an example of, a, of a, something that has a, a through hole. Comes over in there and out there, right? Uh, I don't have spherical topology, none of you do either. Uh, anyway, um, but, um, Fine. The uh, notion of connected components is like these two objects, right? And the idea is that take any place in this object and any other place in this object, I mean in the interior, you can find a path <laughs> staying entirely within the object that goes from that point to the other point. And that's true for every point in this, in this pear-shaped object. And likewise for this one. You, the, the path may need to be curved around, but there's a path. But you can find no path between this object and that object that stays entirely in the pair of objects. So they are not, these two are not connected. And, and this notion of connected component topology is something that will be of concern to us as well. Okay? Questions? <coughs> okay, so so far we're talking about objects in free space that typically hit, the ones that we're talking about have are two dimensional surfaces, have two dimensional surfaces, and they live in free space. But we are not just interested in these objects themselves, but also about their shape. And so we talk, talked about shape, for example, as being in, indicative of a normal, I mean normal being an aspect of shape at a point. And that doesn't live on the object as an abstract object. It's a one-dimensional vector which lives on a sphere, right? Every, we talked about the fact that a latitude and a longitude of the sphere specifies, uh, for the unit sphere, a vector that goes from its center out to the point on the unit sphere. And therefore, we can say that it's isomorphic, uh, the a direction is isomorphic to a point on the sphere, <coughs> to points on sphere, spheres. So we, if we want to talk about the space of all normals, the space of all possibilities of a normal, it's a sphere, <laughs> right? And now if we want to talk about the space of all possibilities of two normals, a normal at one point and a normal at another point, the first one lives on one sphere, the second one lives on another sphere, and the shape space 
is the Cartesian product of that. That is to say, a value has a component on the first sphere, which says the first, where the first normal is, and a component on the second sphere, which says where that second normal is. And if I have n normals, like you see there, then I'm going to have the Cartesian product of n spheres, which we write s2 to the n. <coughs> right? It's s, s2, the two sphere, cross s2, cross s2, n times. Now, <coughs> if Euclidean distances apply, then the shape space may be a high dimensional flat space. In fact, that's what it will be if Euclidean distances apply. <coughs> but what happens when we take a point set, just the points on a surface, the zero dimensional information, if you will, X, the x, y, z positions, and we first take their average, okay? I'm not talking about average over the population, I'm talking about the average of the points in a particular descriptor of an object, right? So there's a bunch of points, <coughs> and we take their average. The center of mass, we say, and let's use the word center of mass and not mean for that thing. We're going to restrict our use of the word mean to mean the mean of a population and not the center of mass of a bunch of places. Okay? And now if we move this whole thing so that the center of mass is at zero, at the origin, we have moved, we have removed three degrees of freedom. We have moved it, moved the x values by whatever the difference well, that each one, if the original origin was here, we've, we are moving all these points by this vector, which has an x component, a y component, and a z component, if I'm in three space. In two space, it's only two. <coughs> okay, so we've moved three degrees of freedom, which means, it turns out to mean that the, there are three constraints I'm no longer in a 3n dimensional space, I'm in a 3n minus 3 dimensional space, right? <clears throat> I'm in a, turns out I'm in a subsphere of 3n minus 3, if I, uh, of dimension 3n minus 3, rather than when we started out, we had n points, each with three dimensions, we were th in, on, uh, you thought we were in a Euclidean space of dimension 3n. Okay, so forget the fact that it's a sphere at the moment, just say it's a, it's a space of dimension 3n minus 3. We'll get to a sphere in a moment, because what we're going to do is we're going to now align by size by taking the square root of the sum of the squares. Notice that our origin is now here. And we're going to take the square root of the sum of the squares of the distances to the origin, and we're going to divide by it. Okay, so now every point is moved in or out along its, along the axis from, of it in such a way that all of the points, the sum of the squares of their distances is one. <coughs> Wait a second, something that has a sum of the squares distance equal, sum of squares of distances is one, is a sphere. That's what makes a unit sphere a unit sphere, that all the points on it have the property that take any coordinate system, okay, if you're in three dimensions, there'll be three coordinates, and the sum of the squares of, of the 3n minus 3 coordinates that are, let's say the 3n the three n coordinates is equal to one. What I'm saying is that x one squared plus y one squared plus z one squared plus x two squared plus y two squared 
2 squared plus z2 squared plus, plus x n squared plus y n squared plus z n squared equals 1. But that's a function of three n variables. All, the sum of the squares of them are equal to 1. <laughs> okay? And so I have a sphere that is a unit sphere, the shape space of a set of points once they have been <coughs> translationally aligned to their center, so the center of mass is the origin, and scaled so that the sum of their squares is equal to 1, is a point on a 3n minus 4 dimensional sphere. Why 4? Because that division by the sum of the square, old sum of the squares, again, removed a degree of freedom. So the upshot is we end up being interested, even when we're talking about the, the <coughs> shape space for an aligned set of points, as it being not on a flat space, but on a 3n minus 4 dimensional sphere. <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> we talked last time <coughs> about not just having a normal on a surface, but a frame at each point on the surface. Or, okay, and we might even have frames inside the surface, but let's just talk now about frames on the surface. Well, a frame takes more dimensions than it takes just to describe a, uh, a uh, direction. Because once you de determine the direction, which takes two numbers, a latitude and a la longitude to describe, you also have this degree of freedom. There's one more angle to describe, right? So if we're talking about the two principal directions and the normal as producing the frame, we have a three-tuple of angles to specify, not a duple. <coughs> so just as the a normal lives in a two-sphere, a frame lives on, lives on a three-sphere. It's hard to think about three-spheres. They live in some higher dimensional space, such as a four-space. But fine, they live, they live on a, on a three-sphere. And realize, as you see from the, di the diagram, the lower diagram on the right of this slide, that a frame can be understood as the rotation you get from a cardinal frame into it. What's the rotation? And that speci fully specifies the frame. And so the result is that rotations live in on a, on a three-sphere. Put another way, frames, three frames live on a three-sphere. But it turns out that you can get a particular rotation either by, if you think of the axis of this guy in four space, this three sphere, it turns out that you can rotate about this, this end or this end. There's two antipodal points, so-called, right? <clears throat> the place opposite you on the sphere. And the, the same rotation can be got by rotating by a certain amount at this, around this, end, this place, or rotating by the opposite, the negative amount of the other end. So the, the sphere is doubly covered, if you will. The set of rotations appear here on a hemisphere and also on the other hemisphere. It doesn't matter which hemisphere you want to talk about, any pair of hemispheres will do, but strictly speaking, the shape space then of the set of frames is the hemisphere of the three sphere. Okay? <clears throat> that thing gets the name SO3, that set of <coughs> possibilities. The special orthogonal set of dimension three. <clears throat> okay. Um, 
So far, we've talked about a number of possible shape spaces. <coughs> and now, remember that we are also going to be talking about the having an object, a base object, for example, a sphere, but better still, an ellipsoid. I can get an ellipsoid by pushing pretty hard on this guy here. Anyway, uh, and <coughs> mapping it point by point into the places it deforms to with the set of displacement. That set of infinite number of displacements, or for your computer scientist, a, a finitely sampled set of positions <coughs> with displacements, is the representation of a diffeomorphism. <coughs> In the set of all those vectors, if you have big N of those displacement vectors, you're again in a, in a space of, okay, so every one of the vectors has a length and a direction, three, three features, because the direction has two. So you have three n dimensions if you have n displacements defining a diffeomorphism. And that three n dimensional space may be huge, but it's still a, a space that uh, can be understood as a as as living on a <coughs> on a space that is a a sphere of dimension. Oh, let's do this right. Uh, a sphere of dimension two n cross a Euclidean. Uh, Cross a space that's called R plus. Well, this pen is not juicy enough. Find my black pen here. So R plus is the set of all positive non neg well non negative integers. Well, no, all positive integers. Okay, so the point is that that thing is a little bit funny because it has a boundary at zero. You can't get negative numbers out of that. And it turns out that, that you can't do Euclidean geometry on things that have where things come break. So the standard thing you do is you take this number, which is a length, for example, and you take log of it, and that turns up that is the, then in the one-dimensional space R1. And so if I have n lengths for the n displacement vectors, I'm going to be in the, their logs, <coughs> log L1, log L2, up to log Ln, is in R is in our n, the n dimensional Euclidean space. And so what I've just said is that a diffeomorphism lives on R n for the n lengths cross S2 to the n for the n directions. Um, Got it? Now, we're going to be interested in the geometry not just of our objects, but the, ob the geometry of their shape spaces. OK, so we're going to be interested in these special properties in these very high dimensional smooth spaces, like I've been talking about. OK? Questions? Get rid of this bar for time being. Trouble is, I, as soon as I say I want to be able to move the bar, move the slide, I end up disturbing the system and it wants to have the cover again. Okay, so these spaces that we're talking about, <coughs> the shape spaces and the objects, their surfaces are called manifolds. 
and just want to be careful with the, the definition of a manifold. A manifold <coughs> uh, is basically a place where you can have a tangent at every place and you can do, and you can do calculus on it. So you can talk about rate of changes of things on that manifold by approximating it at every point. Each one has its own fitted tangent plane. And in a little neighborhood of that tangent plane, you can take derivatives at the point. <clears throat> OK. So we've seen all these things that we've been talking about, the hippocampus that we see in blue here is a, a something with that whose surface is a manifold. <clears throat> and for that matter, so, yeah, okay, it's a manifold. And then this two-sphere we've been talking about here is a manifold. The three-sphere is also a manifold, right? <clears throat> Be careful, though, that there's this sort of cut plane with the hemisphere. Uh, <clears throat> goes into the other hemisphere, where your equator is, if you will. But never mind, we're perfectly happy when we're near the equator to go from, you know, just north of Quito to just south of Quito. Just by the way, I don't know if you all know, that Quito is not, I used to think it was a Spanish word, it's not. It's a, a Quechua, I guess, it's an Indian word, uh, and it means center of the earth. They knew long years ago, long before the Spanish ever came, that there was an equator there. Uh, <clears throat> I, I was there. I did this you know, stand across the, the equator thing. It's a, they, they pull a, a really interesting ruse on you there. Okay, it turns out that in the northern hemisphere, if you think about Coriolis acceleration, the water that goes down the drain goes one way, and if you're in the southern hemisphere, it goes the other way. And they get themselves a, a pan of water, they put it on one, just on one side of the equator, and they say, see, when I empty it, it goes down this way. And they push it on the other side. They see, if you're on the other side of the equator, it goes the other way. Are you kidding me? That, it's that little motion is going to change that? Nah, someone gets it started in the, in, in, the, in the right way or the other way. But they demonstrate. They, they think they're demonstrating kind of Coriolis acceleration to us all. OK, so um, on manifolds, there, uh, there is a tangent plane. I remind you that for the polysphere, which is the, a sphere of multiple directions, a point is not a place on one sphere. It's a point on a polysphere that has a value on each one of the component two spheres. Right? That's, but there is a tangent plane to that polysphere or to any manifold you're talking about. And then you're interested you have a point and you have a tangent plane in this two-dimensional situation, tangent line. And you're interested in the mapping of between the points of the tangent plane or vice versa. Typically, you're talking about the orthogonal mapping. Right? So we're going to map this way. And that way is called the exponential mapping at point P, where this is the point P. And another point P, x sub P, is the exponential mapping at that point P. Why exponential? Because it turns out that in two dimensions, that mapping turns out to be the mapping e to the i theta in complex variables. Uh, and so you generalize 
this mapping to n dimensions, they still call it exponential. Okay, yeah. So log goes from the tangent plane, sorry, log goes from the manifold to the tangent plane. Yes. Okay. And, and x goes from the tangent plane to the manifold. F, x results in a place on the manifold, log ends up with a place on the surface, okay. the tangent surface. Uh, interestingly, let's talk about a, a sphere here. So now this is a plane up there. And if I talk about any place here and interested in the, difference, dis, the distance from it to P, it's some Euclidean distance, right? That's a place on a plane. <laughs> but that's not the same as this the arc, arc length di distance on the, on the sphere. And it turns out to be useful to equip this log transformation not with the distance functions of the Euclidean metric, but with the distance function of the distances on the sphere. <laughs> and so if you, your question, Sam? I was going to say, it's sort of kind of like, like unwrapping the sphere onto the plane. Yeah. And you have, if you think about it, I have, here we're going to have a tangent plane to my hand. If you think about it, distances on my hand this manifold that is my hand surface, for it takes, it goes, it, a long distance here is a very short distance on the tangent plane. Right. But if I go in this direction, a distance along my hand corresponds to a, almost the same distance. So wait, I think you said this would be equipped so what I'm saying is, if the manifold looks like this and your tangent looks like this, in this cross section, this is a long distance that maps onto this short distance. So the metric should be such that this guy's not a, not equipped with the Euclidean distance, but with this long distance. So the Euclidean distance is small, so but the distance. Is the distance that you want to equip the log transform with right. should be the distances on the surface. Right. But if on the other hand, you point the cross-section this way is pretty flat. And so the tangent plane here, this distance and this distance aren't that different. The point is that the the metric that you want is orientation dependent. It depends on which direction on the surface you're moving. And Euclidean distances aren't going to apply if you want to be re representing the shape of the object at the surface, on its surface. <laughs> and this will get us to a so-called, a, a kind of measuring ability, metric, on a surface that is non-Euclidean, more precisely that is Riemannian. Okay, and we will talk about Riemannian metrics very shortly. Okay? Okay, on these manifolds, typically we want to know how far it is from one place on the manifold to, the, to another place on the manifold. How far is it to get from here to here, or on the sphere to get from here to here, or on any object on the upper right you see uh, a donut, a torus, 
and we're talking about distances from one place on the torus to other places on the torus. And the notion of uh, a, a distance from one place to the other, well, there's an infinite number of paths you might take, but you want to find the path that has the shortest distance, right? And such a path is called a geodesic. In fact, a geodesic is more than that because basically a geodesic is a path that is locally straight everywhere. In other words, each infinitesimal piece of it is shortest, right? And you already know from a sphere that if you want to go from here to London, you can either go northeast or southwest. And there's a perfectly good straight path either way. But if you want the shortest one, you'd better go northeast and not southwest. But the point is that the, there, is, there are two geodesics between here and London, one that goes northeast and the other one southwest. And in general, that may be the case. Between any two points, there may be more than one geodesic, but typically one of them is shortest. They may be equal, but fine. Okay, so the point about geodesics, there's a theorem about geodesics on a space, and we're going to be interested in geodesics on shape spaces, um, which uh, says that um, <clears throat> if you start out in some direction on any manifold, the geodesic is fully determined because you go a little bit straight infinitesimally from it to another point on the surface, on the manifold, and now you're at that place, and the fact that you are coming in at a particular direction determines a new direction on its tangent plane, right? <laughs> a new, new point, so it has a new tangent plane. And you piece those all together, and you get a fully defined path. So the upshot is that what's being shown on the, on the video, the movie in the upper panel here, is starting at a point and heading in some direction. And then it's showing you the geodesic path determined by that direction. And the same goes for any manifold, like the sphere. And so what you see in the bottom is a point on the sphere and another point uh, and a geodesic between those two points, which turns out for a sphere to be the, uh, the, the, uh, the, if you will, the equator around it. It's, it's called the great, the great circle. But anyway, the equator if between those two points, if you will. So, okay, so these are interesting points about manifolds and pretty important to us when we talk about diffeomorphisms because we said the space of diffeomorphisms is a manifold and if we want to get from the identity diffeomorphism to the, the least distant diffeomorphism, which does what we want it to do to warp the, uh, the object into that shape, all we need to do, know is what the starting direction at the identity is. So the identity is a point on our space. Once we have a starting point, Everything else is determined, right? The well, not quite everything, because there may be many directions which get you to that point, and we're going to have to find the shortest of the shortest one of those. But this also reminds us that when we're talking about these distances, they depend on these metrics. How do you measure how far far is? Right? And that brings us to Riemannian metrics. <laughs> okay, so the basic idea of a Riemannian metric is that at every place where you, at every position where you want to talk about infinitesimal 
distances of inter infinitesimal length. There exists a frame of the dimension of that manifold. Okay, so if you're talking about S3, we're talking about a three frame. Okay, if you're talking about uh, a, some, a, something that is of this dimension that I had here, then it's going to be a three n dimensional frame. And that frame, there exists a frame such that distances are different in each one of these orthogonal directions. Right, so I gave you the example of distances along my hand and the distances across my hand at this crest place of my hand. Right, and these are, this is the, and I'm on a two manifold here, and so the, there exists this two dimensional frame. One of the directions is along my hand and the other one is across, and it turns out that direct distances in any other direction is got by the weighted sum of squares of the distance weights for each of the respective dimensions. Right, so you have If you know a distance in the first dimension and you weight it by appropriate number, by how, how far, the, where these are Euclidean distances, and these are the weights, and you do that then you get the, the so-called Riemannian distance squared as the weighted sum of the Euclidean distances along the respective frame directions. And it turns out that for a sphere, the, the, the directions you want are the principal directions. The, if you take the two principal directions, For example, at a place, where's my, why am I not seeing my cursor now? Huh. Uh, okay, but it, there it is. Okay, so if I, I'm here, I have this direction and that direction. If I'm here, I have this direction and that direction, the two principal directions. And I've already suggested that distances for going in along the crest direction and distances for along, across the crest direction ought to be understood to be different if it's going to reflect the local distance pattern on the surface near that point. And thus, if we want to get geodesics, which are shortest distance paths on these things, we better use this Riemannian distance, square root of Riemannian distance squared, rather than ordinary Euclidean distances to get, uh, to get geodesics. All right? Yes? Where do the top layers come from? Where do the what? The top layers? They come from the principal curvatures. In, 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 yeah, they come from the principal curvatures. Okay. Um, okay. So, wrong. Sorry, let me fix it. Oh, I've got it. That's what, what I meant to say and what I wrote on the board is d squared, the Riemannian distance squared, is, is the weighted sum of square Euclidean distances. <coughs> yeah. 
Okay, so it follows that geodesics are going to be locally, things that are locally straight, but, and they're locally distance minimizing, right? And things that are, <coughs> I want, where do I have this? Uh, this statement up here in the top. <coughs> if you're trying to minimize something, you always need to send, set a derivative equal to zero, right? And you're trying to do this at every place on the path. And so you end up with a differential equation that you need to solve if you're going to find geodesics. If you're going to compute geodesics, you can go to the web and figure out what the what the form of the differential equation is. For, for the moment, I just want to point out that geodesics are the shortest dis dis paths. And to do that, you're going to need a metric. But once you have the metric, you're still going to need to do minimization to get these straight, locally straight paths, these geodesics. And that's going to involve solving a differential equation. OK? Questions? I have one. Final thing to talk about in this math, this geometry and topology of entities we're concerned with in this course. And you will have had a, a quick tour of differential geometry and topology. And that has to do with curves in space. OK, not surfaces in space, although in some cases, the curve may be on a surface, <laughs> like a crest. <clears throat> and so we want to be able to describe the behavior of curves and of curves on surfaces. And the way that is done typically is with a fitted frame also. And the fitted frame at any given point on the curve understands, first of all, that the curve at any given point has a tangent. It's a tangent line. And we'll call that F1, the first frame direction of the fitted frame. OK? If you understand the, this x, y, z position on, at any given point on the, on the curve as a function of arc length along the curve, s, it turns out that the tangent is just the derivative of x with respect to s. And that turns out to be a unit vector. Put another way, arc length is defined so that the derivative with respect to it is a unit vector. It's the unit tangent vector. OK, so it's a, a norm, an ordinary frame element. The next thing you can do is take three points together near each other, near, near this point. Point a little bit on this side and a little bit that side, and fit. You can fit a plane through three points. And indeed, what you end up fitting is a planar circle. Right? And now, so you see that in the picture here, that the planar circle is fit. And in that circle, there is a normal to the tangent that goes from the point on the circle, the point P, to its center, the center of the circle. And that vector is going to be called the normal of the, of the curve. And it's F2 once it's normalized in length. It's no, not necessarily normal in length. It's simply got by taking the second derivative of the x function with respect to s. And boy, I got the underline over the, under the 2, which I have to fix shortly. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so that's f2. And it's for the best fitting circle. And then what happens is you want to, once you have an f1, f2, you can take the cross product and you get f3, something orthogonal did. So you get a fitted frame, 
And that third thing is called the binomial. So the so-called Frenet frame, after this mathematician Frenet, uh, is this fitted frame where the tangent is f1, the normal is f2, and the binomial is f3. <laughs> OK? Uh, so the first derivative of f1 is in the normal direction, but it has a sign. And depending on whether you choose the inward position of the circle, well, the, the place to go from the point to its center or away from its center, you get a positive or a negative factor. And if we do always go to the in, inward side, then it's always positive. And so the normal direction is always defined as the one on the board. Okay, so here's the fitted circle, and it always is that guy. And it turns out that its length is the reciprocal of the curvature. 1 over kappa is this distance. Okay? So, We now ask, how does the curvature, OK, so the, what happens is f1 and f2 define a tangent plane, define a plane, which one of the directions is tangent, the other one is normal. You have this plane of the best fitting circle. And rotations, it, the, ro the rate of rotation of it is kappa 1, is kappa. The normal, on the other hand, tips and takes you out of this plane. Right now you have the best fitting plane, and when the normal tips as you walk around the curves, you're getting out of the plane. And that's called the torsion. And the rate of doing that is, is called tau. And it's minus the derivative of the binomial with respect to s in the normal direction, the component of it in the normal direction. OK? So or DDF minus DF3 of SDS dot F2. OK, so one is the, the lowest order curvature, which is defined in the, tangent, in, in the plane of the normal and its derivative. I'm sorry, the tangent and its derivative of the normal. And then the rest of the lesser amount is the tip, and it can be in either direction. So kappa is always positive, tau can be even positive or negative. OK? Yeah. So doesn't that also correspond to the, like, the twist on the surface? Sort of, but you've got to be careful when you're talking on the surface about walking directions. Okay. <laughs> and you. There's some very nice math that I chose not to cover here, where you talk about the walking in the tangent direction on the surface, which is a tangent position on the, if the curve's on a surface, the tangent to the curve is also a tangent to the, in the tangent plane of the surface. And if you let that be your F1, it turns out that the, that the tau Uh, it turns out that the coordinates, that the normal and the binormal are not the same because the normal to the, the normal to the curve is not necessarily on the surface, <laughs> right? It may be in a different, it's a different orthogonal to that norm. Oh, and, right, yeah. Okay, and so you get some interest, an interesting piece of equations that relates one to the other, okay? Okay, any questions about anything in this whole section where we've been doing differential geometry and topology? I'm done with it.
Okay, so we get to spend a little time on a new, on a new topic. Just put this guy down. And share. This guy. Okay, so what we've talked about so far are sorry uh, good now if I see if I can yeah. <sighs> trying to get rid of this bar is uh Everybody seeing this at a distance as well? Okay, so till now I have focused mostly on PDMs. I've argued that PDMs actually, after alignment, live on spheres. I've also talked about normals at points. And now we want to start talking about statistics on them. So now I have a population of objects. Hippocampus 1, hippocampus 2, hippocampus 3, hippocampus 4, hippocampus a lot. Right? A big population of this. I'm going to be, I am going to be fast and loose with the word population. For a statistician, a, a, a population is infinite, but we're going to have, we're computer scientists, we're going to have finite populations. Uh, okay, but fine. So, we have these, this population of objects, and every one of them has a PDM. And so I've shown you four hands in my example. One is a, a sort of big hand centered in its space. The next one is a, the same size hand, but it's no longer centered. It's in a different place. It's translated. The next one is a smaller hand, and the third one is that smaller hand rotated, right? And I may have all of those guys in my population. And so we need to talk about doing statistics. And typically, before we do statistics, we need to get correspondence. And in order to get correspondence, you really want to do alignment. You want to rotate these guys. You want to get rid of their size components. <clears throat> you want to translate them. And so we have to talk about alignment and the methods for doing that. Once we have these things aligned, we have correspondence. At least we act as if we believe the correspondence. And so we know what we mean by the first point, the second point, the third point, the fourth point, the you know, little nth point. Uh, anyway, or Typically, well, I try, I try to use big N for something that's big and little N for something that's little. And uh, the size of the population uh, in our training cases frequently is uh, smaller than the size of the <coughs> number of points in th times three or two in this example. And so I'll use big N for the larger of those and little N for the smaller of those. But in any case, um, we have a high dimensional space. We talked about it being in 3D, uh, being a 3n minus 4 dimensional sphere, <coughs> an aligned set of points. And, three, and n may be very large because it's the number of points and we want to represent this thing by maybe in 3D, we might be very, very well may want to represent it by, you know, 500 points. And therefore, we have a 1,500 dimensional space, and we uh, don't want to do statistics on that. So we need to do reduction of these features to get important features. And that's done by a principal component analysis, or something principal component-ish. And the reason it's ish is that principal component analysis works for, for 
Euclidean manifolds, and our data lives on spheres. So we need some, some ability to do principal component type analysis, but on spheres. <coughs> well, the way y'all have learned principal component analysis is what are typically called forward principal component analysis. You find a zero dimensional entity, which is the mean. You find a one dimensional entity, which is a line. <laughs> and then you find a second, using it, you find a two dimensional entity. And you take the orthogonal or the vector orthogonal to that first component, the line to that line, and you get the second principal component. So you go up up in dimension. And it turns out that this an obvious relatively obvious alternative once you think about it is you can start in n dimensions and, and go backwards from n dimensions to n minus one dimensions to n minus two dimensions and so on. So there's forward and backwards approaches which for PCA doesn't matter because you get the same result except for computational error. But for spheres, you don't get the same result, and it turns out to be really important to do it backwards rather than forwards, and you'll see why. <coughs> so that's what we're going to be talking about. And after we do that, we're going to talk about a special space way of thinking about point distributions that Kendall uh, invented in 2D. Then we're going to talk about spherical harmonics that are derived from points. And we will <coughs> be at the end of this section when I finish that. <coughs> now, I want to point out that all the things I'm talking about, prin principal component analysis, pi principal nested spheres, uh, circle harmonics and the statistics on them, is all in the SALT catalog of programs can be found online at, line at salt.slicer.org, including nice tutorials on these, and those are good places for you to look. Okay, so let's get started. <coughs> the first thing I've already talked about, if you have a set of points, these little diamond-shaped things, then you can take their average, which you get by taking their average x, also separately your average y, and separately your average z, and you find an x bar, a y bar, and a z bar, and that's the center of mass. Okay, and it turns out that it is the best zero dimensional measure according to the Euclidean metric. <laughs> Meaning, it is the place if you do Euclidean space, where well, let me talk about let me talk about U here. If we take the sum of the squares over all the points of their distance to the origin, the distance to the, not the origin, but the distance to this point u, we take the argmin over all u's of this thing, what you get is the ord if you use Euclidean distances, the ordinary Euclidean mean, right? You take the x1, the, all the x's, and you sum them up and divide by the number, and you take all the y's and you sum them up and divide by the number. And likewise for the z's, you get this distance minimizer, which gets the name
the Frechet mean? Another Frenchman. If you want to really sound cool, you roll your R like a Frenchman and you say the E, the first E like an A. Right. Uh, anyway, fine. Uh, the, um, anyway, this distance minimizer is the center of mass of the points. <coughs> okay, and now later when we have these points living on a manifold, we're going to be interested in the center of mass over the, the, the mean over the population of this high dimensional points. And we're going to have the mean of the means, if you will. <coughs> okay, fine. But the representation is simple. The, the feature representation is just you list all the coordinates. X1, Y1, Z1 for the first point, X2, Y2, Z2 for the second point, and so on. Right? And, yeah? So it's equivalent, it's like it's one, it's a single point in 3D. It's a, in 3D, it's a single point in 3D, and 2D is a single point in 2D. Right. And the population is a bunch of points. In yes. The population is a bunch. A bunch of these, each one of these guys in the upper right. That's one sample okay. in the population. Oh, yeah. We did this in 775. Then. Mm -hmm. In um, Comp 775 and the processor. What about it? No, just I remember this. Okay, good. Uh, good. Okay, so centering involves taking every point, x underline i, and subtracting the center of mass and letting that be x i prime. Right? You just subtract the center of mass from every point. That just means that the new origin of the set of points is its mean. OK. <laughs> I've also talked about scaling. Right? You take the sum of the squares of all the x i primes, and then you Take the square root of that sum, and then you take this, the sum of the squares of the xi primes values, each one of which has a, is itself a sum of squares, and you take that to the, strictly speaking, well, never mind, I'll do it this way. You take the sum of the squares, you take the square root, and you divide every xi double prime is going to be xi prime divided by this, this thing, the square root of the sum of the squares. And that guy lives on a sphere. Right? And uh, later, next time, because I've run out of time for today, we're going to talk about taking the, the xi double primes and fitting a best fitting ellipsoid. In 2D, the best fitting ellipse. And that ellipse in 2D, or ellipsoid in 3D, will have three axes, three principal axes. And those are going to be the axis you want to rotate to. So we're going to take the, this, take each set of points in the population and rotate it to its best fitting ellipsoids, principal axes, principal radii. And when we can do that, we will have done so-called Procrustes alignment. And we'll talk about that next time. Any questions before we stop? Okay, till next time. I'd like to end up with some questions from Zoom land. I have a question. Yeah. How would you write the the metric like I guess how would you write the like physics notation? How would you write it? Yeah, or like as like a, a metric signature. You'd write it as you want 
Krampus, the, this, no. this guy, according to a Riemannian metric, you'd write it this way. Oh, no, that's not what I meant. I meant, um, like, in general relativity, you have, like, you write, like, like you have, like, the, the integral, the S squared equals terms. Yeah, your, your understanding of relativity is beyond mine, so I don't know the answer to your question. Maybe you do. Okay. I'll come look it up. No, I'm just using the word. Look at that, Andrew Call. Hello, Andrew.